So welcome back. Now we're going to talk about some making our stuff look a little prettier with images and how we can play with images, colors, and fonts. So uh, CSS and images are a lot of fun. Uh, we, ca we can fool around with them. We can move them around. Actually, this for me uh, years ago was the thing that in 1994 that made me fall in, uh, in love with the World Wide Web. So what made me fall in love with the World Wide Web was the ability to take a picture of me, and I love pictures of me, and then I float it to the right, and then I put a little border around here. And so that's what I've done with CSS. So let's take a look at how I've done that. So if you look, if you look in line here, uh, the navigation, which I'm, I only sh I'll show you in when I go through the code walk through how the navigation works. But at this point, at the end of the navigation is right here. And I put this image in. So if you were to watch this inline, the image is right there. But what I do is, when I say float, that actually, and there's other things that we'll see when we start looking at fixed and absolute positions, you can pull it out of the regular stream. And so this is like pulled out of here. It's as if it didn't exist. And it floats to the right, but then it's vertically aligned. So the next thing you see is this header one. This is header one, CSS, I mean, oh, there's a typo there. I gotta fix that. So I'll pretend that that was an H1 there, but that's okay. So this header, at quirks mode, I should run this all through uh, the validator to make sure I'm okay. But okay, so the, the top box of this CSS and image is H1 is right here, and then this floats over, but then it top aligns. Now you can change this alignment if you like, but it top aligns here, and then it actually looks at the width, in this case, the width of the picture, but you can also control the width up here in the CSS. And then it carves out this space, and then I do a margin of one M. And so on M, so uh, uh, it, you, you sort of sometimes wish they would put default formatting on, but then they kind of tend not to put default formatting on because if they did, then you have to turn that off. And so I wanted some white space, and so I had to put some white space around it. And so I said, I'd like a margin of one M. And so that puts a little bit of space here and here and actually here as well. So you see that this lines up over there. And then that talks about what is a one M. So one M, you, I could have said five pixels, five PX, and that would have been fine. But one M is basically the width of the letter M, roughly. It's, it's sort of, it is a width that changes with the size and nature of the font. I think of it as the width of an M, and I think that might be a soft definition of it, but I don't think it's a precise definition of it. But that's what I did. So float right, hoist it, and sends it over here, and then shoves this over so that this text is now, this, it reserves this space so the text is, uh, is wrapped, basically, and then... Um, and then I held out some space just for prettiness, right? And so that's like CSS is making it look pretty. Um, now, what happens here is I, sometimes you want to basically force, after this float has happened, something back to the left margin. And there's this clear equals all that says clear any floats is what it's really saying. And, and so it means that even though this, if it wasn't for clear equals all, this next paragraph would have been kind of up in here. And then maybe it would have wrapped if it was long enough. And when you play with this, you can resize it and see how the wrapping changes. But no matter what the size is, after the BR clear equals all, this is going to format back to the left, the left nav. Right? So that clears that hanging wrap, that, that sort of... But you don't have to. You could just you could not do this, and then it would wrap and wrap and wrap, and then it would get longer and it would continue on. But if you want control over that, you can with the BR clear equals all. Um, and, of course... You can have images right in line, and this was this is just from the HTML bit here. Um, there's nothing fancy CSS here. Images kind of are like big characters. I sized that one so it sort of fit nicely, and you could even make this a clickable link. But that's really just, this part here is just HTML, not CSS. But I could have, if I wanted to, change the width and the height of this. That'd be kind of fun. Make this guy be like the width of an M, and then you'd see it more like a character. So there's a bunch of colors, and um, the colors have to do with, uh, there's uh, the simple thing for us simple folks. You know, we just put in things like red and green and stuff like that, and especially if you're doing a developer and you're just trying to get basic stuff working, I often use colors in my testing that, like, put the border red. I do that all the time to say, where was that div at anyway? So I'll throw a one-pixel border around it, red border. Like, oh, that's where it is, although the Chris Pedrick plugin 
has a thing where it puts one pixel borders around everything for you automatically. But whatever, these are not necessarily most uh, graphically beautiful colors, even though I like them because they're super primary in terms of primary colors and strong. Uh, and you'll see that I kind of use those colors in my slides a lot um, because I'm, I'm not a graphic artist, of course. I just like, oh, the greenest I can be is good. Um, so there's 16 official colors and, and they're here. Um, once you get a little more sophisticated, you can use precise colors from uh, like, a, I think this is a, I don't know, 32 bit. Yeah. So this uh, precise colors are the ones that start with pound sign. And so pound sign, and these are hexadecimal numbers. This is, these two numbers are effectively zero through 255, but they're in hex. So hex is like A, B, C, D, E, F are actually numbers. 0 through 9, this is actually 10, 11, 12, 13, this is 15. And so E is bigger than 9, and F is bigger than E. But basically these are 0 through 256, that's a three, three tuple of 0 through 256 numbers. And so the more red you put in, the higher this is, the more green you put in, the higher that is, and the more uh, blue you put in, the higher that is. So RGB, red, green, blue. And if you're playing with like a slider inside your UI, you might be changing this, but you're just changing these numbers ultimately. And so you, you can um, find these things. Um, you know, so uh, white is all Fs. And uh, so if you turn it all on, it's white. If you turn it all off, it's black. The absence color is black, red, green. So you turn, that's max, max, and max. And so you can make sort of a pure red, pure green, and pure blue. Picking these advanced colors is sort of way beyond my ability as a graphic artist. And people will pick colors. There are sites that help you pick palettes for your pages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there is also a, uh, it, sometimes these colors can have a transparency and there's a fourth set of two numbers that have to do with the, how transparent the color might be. Um, so fonts are also important. Uh, the default font is a Times Roman because that's what computers had in 1994. And I think it's, they're ugly, especially on screens. They're not so bad on print, but they're ugly on screens. Um, and so I tend to want a sans serif font. I'm, it's too bad that they, and maybe they have changed in some browser default for sans serif. I just change it to sans serif all the time I want. Now, if you look at fonts, the font family is kind of a special tag in that um, you ask it a set of fonts. And what you're really doing is you're setting a priority. And the problem is, is depending on whether you're on Windows or Mac or which version of Windows or which browser or what fonts they've had installed, um, you can, you know, fonts might not be there. And so what you basically do is you basically say, okay, I would like this. I think this is a Microsoft font. And if that font's not there, then I would like this font. And I think that might be a, also a Microsoft font. And if that font's not there, then there's Arial. See how much I know about graphic arts? I have no idea. I think this might be a Mac font. And if that font doesn't work, default into the fallback font sans serif. And there is always going to be a serif font, Times New Roman-like, sans serif, Arial-like, monospace, which is courier-like, cursive and fantasy, which are whatever. Um, and so there's, all browsers are supposed to have those fallback fonts. And so you tend to see them here at the very end. And so when you see me, I usually will say Arial Sans Serif or something like that just to get Sans Serif. Although it's quite common, the more sophisticated a page is, the more likely. And the other thing that's, that's increasingly the case is people are downloading fonts and having special beautiful web fonts. And then they download them and then they put that font in here, but then they probably still have fallback fonts. So font family is <clears throat> kind of a, a weird and unique and uh, glorious thing that leads to some really gorgeous web pages because so much graphic and arts work is going into making web pages beautiful and we're going way beyond the, the operating system installed fonts and having pages that download their own fonts. Things that you can do is set the things to bold, italic, dex, text decoration. Remember links have underlines and we can turn them on or off. Um, uh, font sizes are kind of troublesome in that you can you can set them to pixels, but then you're in danger if you get to a certain kind of a screen size or people start zooming the screen and stuff. And so you can tend to use these relative ones, but they're not as guaranteed they're not as guaranteed as you might like them to be. Um, and so just th these are a little bit tricky. Uh, absolute font sizes are a little bit dangerous. 
Um, I tend to just go like, here's my font. Here's the one that's a little larger. Here's a little smaller if I need that. So most of the time I'm tending to do things that are like smaller. If I'm putting like a copyright statement and I don't want to distract from the main page, I'll just make it a little small. You know, I'll say, okay, make this, make this small or extra small. And you know, what if it doesn't turn out to be that much smaller? It doesn't matter. I'm just kind of trying to dis so I'm not an expert in how to use those. I tend to use them as simply as I possibly can because they're not as predictable as it would be nice that they were. So links uh, were in a big part of the early web and the it's called the hypertext markup language, hypertext transport layer, hypertext, hypertext, hypertext. And so links got really special treatment. They used to be uh, blue before you clicked on them and purple after you clicked on them. The blue was to jump out at you and say, please click me and the purple was to say, I've been there because a lot of what you did in the early web is you wandered from place to place to place to places like, oh, I found a new thing. Let me explore this. And so you're always like exploring by clicking links. Once we got to the point where people assumed the web, these links didn't need to be blue and garish colors to teach us these things because people just clicked on everything. And so it became more important to make things pretty. So we have a lot of control uh, as to how we style links. We can we can, we, get, we can say the A tag, we, we've already colored an A tag with just the A at the top. You can basically say an unvisited link is supposed to have the color black. After the visit, it's supposed to be gray. While you're hovering over top of it, it's supposed to have text decoration in none and be black, uh, white with a background of navy. And then active is not so heavily used. It's once you've clicked on the link while the page is loaded. So it's a way to kind of you know, maybe disable it or turn it a color so people think, oh, I better wait until this next page loads. And so when I do the recording, you'll see this. It's a lot easier to see this uh, dynamically. And so there's a whole bunch more samples that I have, and I'll record some walkthroughs of every single one of the samples. And so you can take a look at that at uh, Web Applications for Everybody or in the recordings. So this has been a zoom through CSS. Uh, you know, CSS is quite the art and science and it's evolutionary. I mean, people are specialized in this. They're very good at it. It's a modern form of graphic arts. The basics are there. And I think every programmer who does anything on the web should know the basics of HTML. Uh, you know, they keep moving things better with things like nav tags and, and bootstrap, et cetera. Um, and, and while there will always be like edgy new things in CSS. And so sometimes you'll see CSS with like these Moz fields, which are for Mozilla, for the Firefox, but people are always pushing that boundary. And before you couldn't put rounded corners on things, but then the browsers added extensions to put rounded corners on things. And then everybody kind of agreed on that. So CSS is kind of always going to get better and better and better because for the mobile and desktop, they really want to create as beautiful experience as possible and use standards wherever possible. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, the basics are there. You can do so many wonderful things, especially if you pull in a, uh, something like a bootstrap uh, that just kind of cleans up the rough edges of HTML and makes it generally pretty and takes a lot of responsibility off of you. Um, but you can certainly make a lifetime study of CSS if you like. So I hope you found this useful. I will see you on the net.